Hi, 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 everybody. Anyone seen this talk already? Uh, uh, uh. Okay, I'm going to talk about Sinatra in six lines or how to do crazy stuff in Ruby. As said, I'm Constantine. That Twitter account is important because, um, so I will not take questions during the talk. I will not take questions after the talk. So if you have any issues with the talk, anything you don't understand, uh, you have to whine about it on Twitter. <laughs> that is acceptable. Um, you can give me a shootout and say that Konstantin has a guy, he's so stupid, I don't understand what he's saying. Uh, in the same way, this is important to know, if anyone needs a coffee break, now is the ideal time, because you will learn nothing here. At least nothing useful. All right, you have been warned. Prepare for strange code slides. I think the code I'm talking about was featured in a talk earlier. <sighs> okay, let's get going. In the beginning, Mats gave us Ruby. <laughs> this is Mats giving us Ruby. If you, so I, I guess you're all familiar with, or at least maybe most of you might have heard of this thing called Ruby. If you want to learn more about Ruby in general, here's some really, really useful links <laughs> that you can check out for reading up on Ruby. This talk is also about obfuscation and other fun things you can do to your code. There's a quote I'd like to start this talk with. It's from Why the Lucky Stiff. It's, Until programmers stop acting like obfuscation is morally hazardous, they're not artists, just kids who don't want their food to touch. Let's start with some exercises. And I need you to, like this is like a test for you guys. So I'm gonna so, show you some code and you will tell me what the code evaluates to. Let's start really easy with something that's just three characters. Any guesses? Anyone? Come on. False. Yes, this evaluates to false, obviously. That is because question mark, exclamation mark is actually a character in 1.9 and 2.0 uh, and an integer in 1.8. And then negating that tur turns to false, obviously. Okay, next one. This is pretty straightforward. There's a ternary operator here. <laughs> Question mark? No, it actually evaluates to colon. <laughs> because, uh, you know, this is colon, colon is true, so the first part of the ternary operation will be evaluated, uh, which is colon. Okay. Obviously, you're not doing well on the if there are not too many, too many characters in there, so let's try something longer. <laughs> Pro tip, if your Ruby code is not using pack, you're obviously doing it wrong. <laughs> this evaluates to cafe or something, yes, cafe. You can try it. Anyone already typed it down? No? Yes. So. What? No method error? Uh, those are small, uh, lowercase characters. It's just the fonts. Duh. So uh, if you change the pack, you see there's like a dot here and one six. So this actually is two S. Um, and yeah, so this is like that number to S16, which obviously evaluates to cafe. It's really helpful. Um, another great tool when working with a large code base that you want to structure well um, are here docs. Here docs are amazing. Who knows what here docs are? Okay, cool. So here docs are this thing where you say, uh, like, um, less than, less than HTML, and then you write some HTML, and then you say HTML again, and then that's a string. But the cool thing is, 
you can put quotes around the delimiter <laughs> and then you can use an arbitrary string. So what does this evaluate to? Correct, no method error, undefined method foo. Because there is, that's actually four spaces, not a tab. <laughs> so there's four spaces here, which ends the string. So a string starts here, ends here. <laughs> and then here's where actual Ruby code starts. And another, so this is like a basic tool set on cool development, but not everything is about the technology you're using. It's also about how you present it. A lot of it is about distraction. So one more code example. And now I really need you to focus. If you run this code, what will be printed on the screen? Any takers? None? Ah, oh, you guys. Why am I even doing this? Yell at me. Like, there's, there's like, there's a puts, there's a puts, there's a puts, there's a puts. All of these can be printed. Some of these are printed. Correct. Can you explain it? No. Okay. <laughs> so let me reformat that code for you, and then you'll all see it. So the trick is, there are a few tricks here, but the main trick is that you can basically pass a block to any Ruby method, and if they don't take a block, they'll just ignore it. So this do and up here will do nothing, and this if is actually for all this, the only will do nothing. <laughs> so you just said, how did that happen? When it comes to writing high quality code, the one Ruby developer I really look up to is Yuzuki Endo. You probably have seen his code. His code is amazing, it looks like this. <laughs> if you evaluate that, it outputs more code, and that looks like that, and so on, so on, so on. You get the gist. So I come back to him in a second. I'll just wanted to show him the uh, high quality code he's writing. It's a shame he hasn't turned this into a gem yet. <laughs> but first, let's, let's get to my all-time favorite Ruby feature. I so much like it that I implemented this feature, uh, but I'll talk about that in a second. It's called flip-flops. And um, flip-flops are named after these things. Uh, those are like the, one of the basic units, usually built from transistors in your computer. Uh, they're basically a one-bit memory cell, so the, it's not just the current input, but also the last state. And flip-flops in Ruby look like that, dot, dot. If this condition, dot, dot, that condition. And this is not a range, this is a flip-flop. So, This expression, so does anyone, any guesses on what that prints out? Ah, oh, you guys. Obviously it prints three, four, five. Because this expression is false for one and so on for two and then once it reaches true, this expression becomes true. And then the flip-flop stays at true until this expression back here becomes true. Okay, what does this print out? Prints out three. But maybe that's not what you want. Like now you would have to write such complex code to make sure like, um, so what you maybe want is th to ignore this expression completely if this expression is true. And amazingly Ruby can do that. Just add another dot. <laughs> so this will print out all numbers starting from three, four, five. Who here has used flip-flops? Okay. So, in production. 
So there was this suggestion in Ruby issue 5400, can we please remove flip-flops, where Magnus Holm said, nobody knows them, nobody uses them, let's just get rid of flip-flops, shall we? Along comes Yuzuke Endo and says, hello, I am one of the few users of flip-flop. <laughs> and he pastes some real code where he uses flip-flops. Code looks like this. <laughs> okay, one second, I run this. Okay, um, well, he then added, uh, sorry for off topic, I have no objection to deletions. <laughs> Any Anyways, so the one big issue I had with Rubinius, Rubinius is an alternative Ruby implementation, is that Rubinius did not support flip-flops. A few years back, I opened an issue for that, saying, hey, no flip-flops, and Evan told me, Evan. Phoenix, the creator of Robinius, told me, yeah, once you can show me real-world code using flip-flops, I'll implement it. So at the time, we still had Google search, so I, I spent hours creating the perfect regular expression, because you could search with regular expressions, which was amazing, uh, for finding all code that's out there that's using flip-flops. And all code that I found was either testing that flip-flops work <laughs> or was an example code on how flip-flops work. But now I had real code. So I sat down a weekend and implemented flip-flops for Robinius. And apparently it's the most stable feature in Robinius because there has not been a single bug report about it. Since Rubinius is a lot of Ruby, I implemented the complete feature in Ruby. This is the most important part of it, um, which basically, uh, actually when the bytecode comes along, um, executes it. But enough about just how awesome Ruby is for writing good code. Let's look at some real world projects. So, some of you might have switched from Rails to Sinatra to cut down all those dependency hell, all that code you're pulling into that you have to rely on. But as a friend of mine who used to maintain Sinatra constantly says is, I've been bloating the code base. Um, so basically, it's not, if you really want to cut down on the code, you're relying on Sinatra is not the way to go, I'm sorry. But I came up with a solution. It's called Almost Sinatra. It's as little code as possible. Right now it's just six lines. And obfuscation was never the goal. It's just a byproduct of trying to use as little code as possible. This is the code. So. Everyone can read that, right? Someone want to read it out loud? Uh, so what works? So I'm not sure how well you know Sinatra, but configure blocks work, helpers work, sessions work, um, before blocks work, um, routes work, of course, including templates, including assigning uh, instance variables that are used in the templates, uh, even inline templates work, where you say underscore underscore end, and then you have the templates down there. And um, params, like query params work, you can pass locals to the templates, uh, and so on. This is where we actually demonstrate that the session works. Yes, as I said, inline templates work, we can just write it all as one file. And so I wrote this, ooh, like, three years ago now, a bit more than that, I think. Push it online and then basically never touched it again. 
until I was supposed to give a talk about it. And I looked at the code and was like, oh my god, how does this work? I don't understand a thing. Luckily, after I published this, people sat down and analyzed the code and wrote blog posts. So I could actually go and read some blog posts to understand the code I wrote. <laughs> really helpful. There are a few techniques I use in this code. One is simplify and compress, or that's what I call it. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but whatever. So almost Sinatra, unfortunately, has some dependencies. So I'm going to talk about that in a second. And so, so you need to load them, and it needs to set up some signal handlers, which are used for when you press Control C to kill your application. So it needs to do this, and if you look at it, it's already six lines. We could easily get rid of that one line, but that puts at us at five. That is not acceptable. So let's simplify this code. The obvious simplification, uh, since you see there are three requires here and two traps, that's not very dry. So the obvious simplification is to use loops. Way simpler, dried up, only one require, only one trap. The amazing trick you can do with loops, if you have two loops, you can turn it into one loop. You just take these and put them there, and then you try to require the library. <laughs> if that throws a load error, you just trap the signal handler. Long, long variable names are for uh, pussies. So, Let's save some there. You can remove some white space. And here's an amazing trick. If you're ever in this situation, oh no, that's already the trick. <laughs> Sorry, I was too fast. So it's require rescue trap, right? But this is amazing. Look at this. There is a curly bracket here, and there's a space here. So we want to get rid of this space. This is our goal. We don't need a space after a curly bracket, so we can just swap them around. If you, if you write code where you can swap the rescue class with the body, you know you're on a good, good path. <laughs> so you just swap them around, save the space. And there's more in here. So obviously there's more white space and the line breaks, et cetera, et cetera. I leave that in here just for the slides because otherwise it would be really small. We already had that. But one code smell <laughs> is using each. Each is way too long. I mean, each returns this array, but you don't care about the return value anyway, so what does it matter what that method you call returns, so you can also use map. <laughs> it's shorter, it's better. Nice and short. And so one thing I do that doesn't save a character, but um, saves energy, so if you, if you're like me and put your code on a black background, then everything that's illuminated here needs more energy than the black background. So using characters that are smaller saves energy. It's really good for the environment. <laughs> if you use percent %w, you can use any characters for delimiting the string, or the, the array in that case. It also works with the percentage %q and whatever for, for strings. So any character, one of the smallest characters, I haven't tried this with Unicode white spaces, that might also work, but if you don't want to experiment that much, you can also just use a dot. <laughs> and well, so if you look at the code I pasted earlier, that's actually the first line of the code. And then the second technique I use I call it fake it till you make it. It says if, so anyone who's used this, who didn't write me an angry email, only ever tried it with example code and not a real application. So all almost Sinatra needs to do is work for example code. So for instance, um, Get, post, put, delete, all those methods, they ignore the request method. We just define 
a response for that route. So only the route is actually paid attention to. But so people don't actually try the same route with different request methods when they run almost Sinatra, so no one notices. Um, it also always pulls in the session and always puts a lock around it. So the enable session thing I showed you just does not do anything because sessions are just enabled. Um, a cool technique here to save characters is pulling out the define method method from object and assigning it to a constant. That's how I, I start half my projects. Um, and then Ruby has this really neat syntax for calling a block. If you don't want to say call, you can also use square brackets, but square brackets has an issue that you cannot pass a block to it. So you can just use a dot and parents, and then you can pass a block to it. It's a really neat technique. I can just recommend that. Also, in general, constants are better than global variables because global variables always are at least two characters. <laughs> and also, one thing you also want to do, you see that up here uh, is you want to reuse assignments. So this assignment is used like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, something like that times. Um, and then just fake all the methods people might be using. So these methods that enable, disable, configure, help us use register basically do nothing. Um, there is one global request object that the parents and the session method are sent to. Uh, this is also why we need the lock that I showed you here, because global states are no concurrent access. But people in Rubyland don't use concurrency anyways, so this is fine. Um, this is for the templates. It's really cool. Pass all the templates at once. Um, set it all to this. Here's a regular expression that's really handy. Um, that's in the multi-assignment. Um, yes. Obviously, really nice code. Um, loads all the templates at start. I think this actually only supports inline templates and not templates from uh, other files. And yes, so just so actually, this is not the latest code. I got a code update. Um, a pull request, it's really cool, it increased the number of characters, but it was worth it because, so one thing, one, the only thing people were offended by reading this code is that it's using magic numbers. So the current code does something like date new to i plus something to eliminate the uh, magic number, or something like that. Uh, so it does some calculation based on what date gives you if you don't parse a date, but say date new, um, which really improves the code quality because no more magic numbers. I'm not sure if you noticed this, but it's all about the fun. And from now on, I'll just start quoting myself. <laughs> if your app, app does not run with almost Sinatra, please open a Sinatra issue. Versions are to software what subversion is to Git. And also, to agree with Chad, don't include tests. Tests just build the code base, just commit. The users will complain if you break anything. <laughs> don't tell anyone I work at Travis CI. <laughs> so what else? So we have this amazingly slim stack now that we eliminated the bloat that is Sinatra. But I talked about this first line where I pull in the dependencies. One of the largest offenders in the dependencies for code to rely on is actually REC. So I wrote almost REC <laughs> to prove that REC is simpler than Sinatra. It has a bit of a different requirement. It's supposed to be just three lines. The lines ha all have to be the same length and no longer than 120 characters. 
because I think that's really nice. It looks well in my editor. And also, this allows me to tweet out every line and add a hashtag. <laughs> and what works? Middleware works, everything works. You can pass it a proc and everything. And this is the code. Oh, there's, yeah. So um, this code uh, actually even includes logging, including um, statistics, how long the request took. I mean, it's actually a random value. <laughs> you can see it big there. But it's actually, so this is a value uh, that's up to one second, but I divided by 321 um, to make it faster. <laughs> and one thing this even does that not even REC does for you, if you run this on OS X, once you say like, almost rack up your config.ru, um, it will open the web browser for you. First of all, I really like that because I want to check if something is working. And the other thing is that when I wrote this, I still had space left on the last line, so I needed to add something. Again, big problem, port is hard-coded. Um, you know that HTTP requires those status lines, like 200, okay, 404, find not found. Um, this is actually a lot of logic, and no one ever looks at them really. So, almost rec just always uses OK. <laughs> you can really save characters and logic on that. Less logic is always better. Um, so, the big problem so we now have this amazing, amazing stack. Almost Sinatra running on top of almost rec. The big problem. As you should be aware, security. <laughs> so I wrote almost protection. <laughs> almost protection is amazing. Like all the all the attacks out there, like this is just a subsection of the attacks that protects you against. This is including SSL based attacks, shoulder surfing, where where is it? Somewhere there. Uh, it protects you against off by one errors and all those other amazing things. I mean, who here is taking care of their NoSQL injections? <laughs> one guy back there. And you're all laughing, but the security is not a joke, seriously. So this is really, I mean, you might have guessed that I was a bit sarcastic before. If you haven't, this presentation up until here was not serious, but security is not a joke. So it's clean code, it's a lot of lines. Um, I rearranged it, but this is all the code. You can see there's some logic, so rag protection is a middleware, it saves some configuration. Then every HTTP request, or every request in general, comes in through the call method. So we'll check if it has a reply for, for that scheme, that um, protocol. And if it doesn't, then it hands it on to the application. And the logic is really simple. If the scheme is HTTP, it might be an attack, so prevent it. <laughs> if the scheme is HTTPS, it might also be an attack. I mean, it's way more secure, but you're never sure, so prevent it. And now the tricky part, if this is a request to brew coffee, it might actually be a mean uh, denial of service coffee brewing attack. So let's just pretend to be a teapot. So basically what this boils down, it's a bit of complicated logic. Ooh, the last few seconds are running. Uh, it's a bit of complicated logic. I was just amazed by this countdown thing. Is um, simply reject every request. Problem solved. Conclusion. <laughs> are you seriously expecting a conclusion for this talk? 10 seconds, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Thank you.